again, this is Mark Griffin, the Director of Customer Solutions here at Constructs, a team of software engineering experts led by legendary author Steve McConnell. Here we believe every software team can be more successful delivering higher levels of business value. Today we're departing from the norm a bit and happy to share the first of two episodes featuring a very special guest, Jeff Atwood. Jeff is a software developer, author, and entrepreneur known for many things, including his coding horror blog, co-founding the computing programming question and answer website Stack Overflow, and is currently developing Discourse, a powerful open source discussion platform. Over the holidays, we recorded Jeff and Steve McConnell discussing Steve's new book, More Effective Agile, which Jeff had just read. Steve and Jeff have known each other for a long time since Jeff reached out regarding using Coding Horror as the name of his blog. Many of our astute listeners will remember that Coding Horror was the title of a repeated sidebar in Steve's book, Code Complete. Well, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Let's let Steve tell that story. Enjoy. So I remember getting a contact from Jeff, and uh, um, it was funny to me because the Coding Horror sidebar was actually one of my favorite parts of the book, too. And so I thought it was pretty cool that uh, somebody had zeroed in on that part that I liked so much. Uh, The one thing I didn't like about it was that in the draft version of the manuscript, I had a version of the coding horror icon that I really liked. And then when the book came out with the final art, I actually didn't like the marginal art they had for that as much as I liked the art in the draft. So it's kind of funny to me when I look at your blog and I see that uh, published version of the coding horror icon. I like the idea, but I'm always like, oh, I kind of liked my original uh, version of that draft art better. So obviously the blog, the blog and the idea of coding horror has resonated because it's been a super popular blog. I mean, the blog has been about as popular as the book, if not more so. Yeah. Well, I, that, that's quite a compliment. I mean, to me, that was just such a groundbreaking book and, um, the way it concentrated on, you know, sort of the way you treat each other in your work environment and the way you approach the work. It was a very thoughtful, sort of introspective way to look at it and very holistic and rang very true to me. So, um, yeah, I want, I kind of wanted to riff on that with the blog, right? Like what are the deeper ways that you improve yourself as a programmer? that how do you improve yourself as a person even, you know? Uh, and I thought those were really powerful, resonant concepts. And, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think that topic is evergreen. I think uh, just in the last uh, month or so, I've had extended conversations with people about really revisiting the basic topic of what really makes for a professional programmer, how do you improve um, you know, are really good programmers born or made? You know, if you start out as a mediocre programmer, is it possible to become a really good programmer, or do you have to be born that way? I mean, these are these are interesting topics still, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And um, one thing I do want to mention is you gave me a copy of your new book, More Effective Agile, and it really struck me going through that book how software development has changed Um the way we approach it has changed. And I was curious, like, what your thoughts are having written, you know, books. I mean, what, what year was your earliest book? Code Complete, yeah. That was the first one. That was the first thing I ever wrote was a 900-page book. <laughs> uh, even from Code Complete, like, the way we um, approach uh, software development has kind of been changing, and I think for the better. So I was curious what your take was. Like, do you feel like it's been like a, a radical change? Do you think things are completely different than they were, say, in the mid '80s, this is the '90s? I I think it has been a pretty radical change, all things considered. And you know, it's been gradual. It hasn't been like anything happened overnight. And all of a sudden, everything was massively different. But I do think it's been a steady accumulation of improvements over time. And you know, I think some of the issues that um, I talked about in the first edition of Code Complete just basically don't exist anymore. I think uh, really crude programming environments, I mean, everybody's got things they like and don't like about their environment, but, you know, in the first edition of the book, I had a vision for an, essentially an IDE, and by the time the second edition came around, I didn't need it anymore because the vision had essentially been realized in commercial products. And, you know, so the tool support is better. Um, the idea of fragmented tool chains where you spend huge amounts of time just trying to get your editor to talk to your compiler to talk to your um, linker. I mean, these these problems I think are you know largely gone. I think in you know in certain environments we still see instances where people have that kind of issue, but in the main it seems like it's way less common. Um, 
You know, we do uh, technical due diligence as part of what we do at Constructs, and we don't see a lot of code that has like no attention to variable names or just completely random uh, variable names. You know, for the most part, we see code that or the names are at least okay. Um, that was not the case when the first edition of Code Complete came out, but you know, I think that's an improvement. Um, and I mean, that's all just at the code level. I think we don't, you know, we 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 still do occasionally see, you know, incredibly huge classes or routines that might be a thousand or multiple thousands of lines long. But again, that's really the exception. It's it's uh, the rare exception now, whereas it was. You know, maybe still the exception 25 years ago, but it wasn't anywhere near as rare. Um, and just, you know, way more thought put into uh, modularity. And it doesn't mean that everybody has become a great designer, but it does, I think, mean that people are at least trying to pay some attention to the details at the code level. And I think a big part of the contribution to that is just the move toward more incremental development practices. And, you know, once you once you insert the idea of incremental not well, of, uh, of frequent um, integration and some kind of testing where really frequent I think is anything a day or more or more often I think that just naturally gives rise to smaller chunks of code um, trying to get smaller bits of code working at a time and uh, and I think that ends up setting up a virtuous cycle where you know, whether by design or just by accident, the design quality improves because you're biting off smaller chunks and getting those to work uh, piece by piece. And so I think it all just ends up being kind of a virtuous cycle. And it's not to say that every single aspect of it is better, but um, yeah, I think overall we've seen seen really significant improvement. Uh, and if I could just mention one other thing, when I wrote the first edition of Code Complete. The uh, lack of incremental integration was still a fairly big deal. Uh, the computing literature at the time was just full of examples of what were called big bang integration, where teams or individuals would write sections of code separately, and they would spend months working on separate sections of code, and then they would try to bring them together all at the end, and then there would be a big bang and nothing worked. And it was pretty common in the 70s and early to mid 80s for projects to fail at so-called integration time. And, you know, these days, I suspect that idea is so foreign that a lot of people who have only been programming for five years or ten years can't even imagine that people would be so stupid as to try to delay integration for weeks and weeks or months and months. But that was common practice back then. And I think that is a problem that we just don't see anymore. The idea that people write code separately and something fails at integration time. The idea even of integration time is, I think, is an, an extinct idea and has been extinct for quite a while. Yeah, I. that's the thing, I think the, the primary thing that struck me on the More Effective Agile book is how we've kind of really evolved the way that we do software. I think there's more of an honest acknowledgement of about the sort of watery nature of software where it's really difficult to plan it. So you almost just have to build your whole cycle around the fact that you can't. It's super difficult to plan. It's super dif difficult to predict. So um, I really enjoyed that. And particularly the idea of, as you said, like start smaller, always break off smaller pieces if you can, rather than that big bang model of here's a giant project. <laughs> We're going to spend a year working on it and then you know eventually ship it. Uh, which seems, as you said, so alien now for anyone to even talk about software that way. I think any meaningful approach to software development has to seriously consider how errors are going to be addressed because people are going to make errors. The nature of the activity is highly complex and error-prone, and so they're going to come in one way or another. And I think that one of the problems with Big Bang integration or any kind of infrequent integration is you, you just let errors creep in for too long before you do something about any individual batch of errors. And if your batch of errors is effectively the entire project, that's just overwhelming and it's not going to work. If your batch of errors is what happened in the last two hours, well, that's a lot more manageable. Um, so I think, I think errors are a big deal. <laughs> and I think another way to look at the problem with big bang integration or more kind of like you said of just trying to plan out everything is is that software development approaches that require omniscience don't really work very well and so once you assume that once you take to heart the idea that no one's omniscient 
then you've got to consider, okay, if they're not omniscient, then what kind of errors are going to creep in? When are they going to start creeping in? How are we going to address them? And I think that actually gives rise to pretty naturally the idea of we've got to take a more incremental approach because we're just we're going to make mistakes and we need to give ourselves a chance to correct them. There's also a strong focus here on autonomy, uh, which I thought was really interesting and also very true at a couple different levels. One, in terms of just, you know, your, your, your mental state as a team. You want to have the idea that you're, you have agency to actually solve the problems that are in front of you, and you have the authority to make decisions that actually matter relative to your project. Uh, but not just, you know, from a team morale standpoint, but also the way you're building the software. You know, like you, you, you have to be empowered to, as you said, these vertical slices that cut down, you know, like an actual feature from beginning to end on the product how the user would experience it, you know, what it does, what the purpose of it, what bug or problem it addresses. And having full responsibility for that was was really a neat discussion. Um, and again, I think in all just the reason you need people to be so empowered is because the problems are so complicated and so difficult to define in advance that you're really trusting people to just look at the problem and essentially figure it out, you know, without being micromanaged and... Um, it, it was a very whole. It's a very holistic book, which surprised me. <laughs> uh, I was expecting more of sort of you know a list. There was plenty of lists, you know, for the for the exacts. They need their bullet points and stuff. Um, but that holistic well, idea. Well, I'm a list maker. Yeah, yeah. So I thought that was really interesting and well. And again, just sort of more honest acknowledgement of the the problems are just like water. They're really difficult to build on, and you have to structure the the whole approach for to accommodate for that. Yeah, I think this is a case where what I would consider to be the humane and human approach and the effective approach are completely overlapping, and that is software development is thought work. And one of the things I say in the book is that you're essentially renting space in people's brains. You're asking them to think about what the business wants them to think about. You can't compel that. You can't really observe it from the outside. You have to set up conditions that make them want to do that. And, you know, in theory, if somebody was digging a ditch or putting rivets in an airplane, somebody could stand over them and watch and make sure that they're doing it. But in software, even if somebody's standing over you, unless they actually are capable of doing the same thing you're doing, they're not going to have any idea what you're thinking about or what you're actually doing. So the idea of giving people autonomy, I think, not only is it kind of enlightened management practice, but it also is probably about the only way this works effectively, just because you've got to set up conditions that make people think about what you want them to think about. And, you know, and you can't compel that. All you can do is, you know, it's sort of like gardening, you know, you can plant the seeds and or till the soil and plant the seeds and make sure there's enough water, but you're not going to be the thing that makes it grow. You've got to just stand back and let it grow after you've created the conditions for it. And I think, uh, setting up and running a successful software development team is similar. You've got to set up the conditions, but the team is what has to do the work. Yeah. So that was, I think, fun to read. Uh, and I think uh, I, I've read, I think, most of your earlier books, but the, it was nice to see what I viewed as sort of an evolution. And, and everyone's not, not just yours, but just the, the way the industry is looking at this. Like, it feels like actual improvement. <laughs> Uh, because the whole Gilligan's Island metaphor, which you used in Code Complete, actually was quite amusing to me that, you know, you keep doing the same <laughs> things and you're always stuck on the island. Like, it feels like we're actually getting off the island a little bit, which is nice, you know. Um, well, we're dressing up the island at least, for sure. <laughs> Maybe we're building a sandbar extending the island. I don't know. But it, it just <laughs> feels like, uh -huh. you know, in the last 20 years, we've sort of made some progress because this... You know, I run Discourse, uh, which is a big, giant open source project, and so every time I'm reading this, I'm thinking, you know, I'm essentially the, the product owner. So this is a book that was kind of literally written for me in terms of <laughs> uh, the, the way you approach stuff. And I found that you know, the advice here is is accurate. Uh, you know, like it, it it makes sense. It's the way we approach Discourse for the most part. Um, and yeah, I think there's a huge overlap there. And I can't remember if I actually said it in more effective agile or not. But in one of the talks I give, I say that one of the keys to successful leadership in software development is treating your staff like volunteers. And to me, it, you know, I don't actually see a huge amount of difference between um, running an open source project where really everybody is a volunteer versus running an in-house project where you know, number one, you're renting space in people's brains. And so in that sense, they're kind of a volunteer because they've got to want to do the work. 
But in another sense, in today's labor market, people are incredibly mobile. And if they don't like doing what you're doing, they can easily move somewhere else. And so, you know, you're paying them, so they're not volunteers in that sense. But, uh, you know, it's a it's a, a relationship where you uh, you have to hold the relationship gently. Uh, you know, I think about, so I play golf a little bit, and Arnold Palmer said that you could you should hold your golf club like you're holding a small bird in your hands. And, you know, he's trying to say, be very gentle. And I kind of think... In running a software team, it's that same idea applies. You've got to hold it like a, you're holding a small bird in your hands. It's, you know, you have to be gentle with it. You know, give it direction, but um, you know, if you overwhelm it, it's pretty easy to crush the spirit of the team and not get the results you want. Yeah, absolutely. So one thing I did notice in this book is uh, I always check all your books for mentions of the Pontiac Aztec because that was my favorite theme from Code Complete. I was like, wow, this, 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 this particular car gets mentioned a lot, and uh, that was quite amusing. But I, I did, sadly did not find Well, you know, the Code Aztec Complete um, 1 didn't mention the Aztec because uh, uh, the Aztec wasn't out yet, but in Code Complete 2, it just, uh, I don't know. I thought Code Complete 2 needed some kind of update in the humor department, and I thought the Aztec was funny. So, uh, Oh, it's very... I, I will say that I was I was for some reason thinking about the Aztec a couple weeks ago, and my favorite column on the Aztec is by this columnist who referred to himself as Pope Alien, and uh, it hasn't been online for several years. But it did occur to me to go search for it in the Wayback Machine, and I was able to find the original column in the Wayback Machine. So I was quite pleased with that. Ah, that's always very satisfying when that comes together. And the other funny thing I like about the Pontiac Aztec, it's featured in the show Breaking Bad, like a <laughs> a terrible, uh-huh. like, like army green, just almost like a vomit-colored car. So they really played up the, the Aztec, got a lot of mileage in that show uh, as the stereotypical... I saw a clickbait thing that talked about the most influential cars of the 20th century, and the Aztec was on the list. Wow. And... Uh, I couldn't believe it, but they referred to it as essentially like the very first attempt at a true crossover vehicle. And I find that a little hard to take just because, and the article was very defensive. It just talked about, the article essentially said the whole thing would have worked great except they used overly cheap plastic in the car. And I do not think that that was the main problem with that car. But uh, <laughs> Just that, just that plastic. Yeah, that was the only real problem. That makes sense. Right. So another... Um, thing I liked about the book is sometimes you go up with some very colorful and fun metaphors. And I think my favorite one for this book is the Knevin framework. Oh, yeah. Uh, which is, it, it, did you say it's a Welsh word? What, what, it has a very interesting etymology. I had never heard this word, so. Yeah, so as I understand it, and you know, I did not come up with the idea. Um, Dave Snowden is the one that's usually credited with coming up with the idea, and I think he actually co-authored it, but he's the guy who kind of took ownership of it and ran with it. Um, so, Knevin is a Welsh, Welsh word that uh, translates, apparently it doesn't translate exactly into anything in English, but roughly translates into habitat or neighborhood. And I think the thing that is meaningful about that is Knevin is a means of understanding uh, complexity and uncertainty, and Kine- or Snowden refers to it as a sense-making framework. And as a left brain guy, when I hear phrases like sense making framework, my skin kind of crawls a little bit. But (laughs) I think what he's trying to say, well, he doesn't try to say this, he actually says this is that technical people are very inclined to categorize and classify. We want very tidy taxonomies of things where we can put into outline form and there are crisp boundaries between the, the different categories. And Kinevin is not that. Kinevin is not saying that there are crisp boundaries. It really is the concept of neighborhood or habitat just says, look, there are clusters of meanings that occur together in a neighborhood or habitat. And it just helps you make sense of the complex or uncertain situation that you're seeing. And I think the point is that not all of the attributes are going to apply in all cases, you know, and you're going to find cases where you know, six of the attributes from one neighborhood apply and three of the attributes from another neighborhood apply. But that does still help help you in understanding what you're dealing with. And I found Kinevin to be a very useful way to introduce uh, the need for agile development practices and introduce a basis for understanding why uh, really linear practices like uh, so-called waterfall model uh, end up being so challenged really for reasons that you mentioned a little bit ago in terms of just the idea that you could uh, 
um, plan everything out from the beginning, know everything that you're possibly going to need to know um, from the beginning, and so on. Yeah, the acknowledgement, the implicit acknowledgement in the book is that you essentially have to get stuff out into the world and use it to understand it, which is very, very true to me at the at the deepest levels of programmer. Like, and I, I often say on the discourse project that we have to get a feature to the point that we can live with it before we actually even understand the feature. Meaning, it has to be active, live. We have to be. It has to be part of our normal routine in using the software. And even then, like, it, it, it'll behave totally differently than I thought it would. Like, there's this big disconnect between the way you think things are going to work and the way they actually work once you ship it and start using it uh, on so many levels. Um, so it's nice to sort of see that acknowledged. And so this uh, Kinevin framework, I also love the way that you get through this discussion, and then you essentially throw it. There's four quadrants. There's complex, complicated, chaotic, and obvious. And then you're like, no, we're just going to throw out the bottom half of this chart, because <laughs> that doesn't happen in software, right? You threw out the, the chaotic and the obvious. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I mean, obvious says that <laughs> the, the factor in obvious that I think is just completely uh, inapplicable to software is there has to be one agreed upon, one universally agreed upon solution to the problem. And I don't think I've ever in my entire career seen a software problem where there was one universally agreed upon solution to the problem. I mean, the whole nature of software design is that it's non-deterministic. So I would challenge someone to come up with any problem that's simple enough that there would be one universally agreed upon solution. And in the book, I think I mentioned Hello World as the most complex problem that that would apply to. Um, but I'm not even sure you would get universal agreement on any individual Hello World program. So, so I just think that domain doesn't apply. Right. That was a very effective, colorful analogy. I really like that. And then um, one other thing you mentioned in the book as almost like it's so good that it's almost a silver bullet, um, I, I, I really found uh, I wanted to clap for that part because I just like that point so much. Do you remember what that was in reference to? <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> it was about uh, putting programmers in direct contact with the users. Oh, Mm -hmm, and right. in a way, like the discourse project that I'm on is kind of w one of our implicit models is like, that's how we run discourse. You know, we being an open source project, we don't really have a choice, but I, I think it's possible to run a lot of software this way, except for super highly, like, I don't know if you could do an air traffic controller software this way, but a lot of software that you're going to put out in the world uh, is just, you know, having the people on your team regularly interact with the users. And that's what discourse is. It's a tool for interacting with your users, right? Like, how is this working? You know, what are we doing here? <laughs> how do I install this? You know, what about the usability questions? All that stuff we discuss, like, using discourse itself. It's a tool that facilitates that kind of um, structured discussion. And I realized when selling discourse, one of my implicit lessons to other software teams was, well, this is just how you do it, right? Like, you put the stuff out there, and then you go talk to your users. And it was interesting that I would talk to people and they'd be like, what? Like, what What do you mean? Like, we talk to the users like they don't? I had internalized that so much that, like, that, well, this is obviously how you do it because there's no other way that makes any sense, right? So it was lovely to see you talk about that as, like, the silver bullet. Like, the one thing you could do on your project that always makes it better <laughs> is have the people on your team regularly do, essentially, support calls, right? Like, talk to the users and, you know, talk to, just to see the people using the, the software, right? Um, I love that. Yeah, and I think that you know different different kinds of software um, are intuitive to developers to different degrees. If you're developing a programming tool, then the developers are the users, and so they can make lots of valid assumptions about what the users are going to do with the software and how they'll react. In a tool like Discourse, you're probably somewhere in the middle, where developers can definitely use the tool. They probably use similar tools. Um, or environments, and so that, again, they can be reasonable proxies for the end users. They might be sort of a biased proxy for a certain type of end user, but you know they're not completely clueless about the end users. But you get into other kinds of software. You get into business business system software, highly technical application, not technical, but scientific applications, um, or other super specialized applications where the developers can't be proxies for the end users. You know then. You know, you can kind of assume that you're doing a good job when you're working on utilities or or um, programs where the developers can kind of sort of approximate the end users. But as soon as you get outside of that space, then you know things can fall apart pretty quickly. And so, 
uh, I think the idea of getting developers in you know regular, meaningful contact with the end users and seeing how they're uh, developing or how they're using the software can be just you know really mind opening for um, for developers. And we've had some pretty interesting examples in our company over the years uh, where you know the developers will tell us the stories about as they've gone out and seen end users interacting with their software. You know, we had one uh, company we worked with in the gaming industry, meaning casino games, and they had a significant offshore staff in India. Well, their offshore staff had never even seen a casino game. They didn't understand what the concept was. And so the company actually ended up flying uh, their development staff for uh, essentially a retreat. I believe they went to Bali where they could actually play casino games for a few days just so they could kind of understand what the user experience was. And to me, that was a pretty hilarious example just because the idea of your company paying you to go play casino games as a professional development activity was uh, a funny idea. But um, we had another example where we had a client who was developing uh, Minilab photo finishing software. You know, you go to Walgreens or CVS and you drop off your USB stick, and then you come back in a while and get your photos. And uh, um, their mental model for how this worked was that there was a person behind the counter uh, somewhere, and they were doing lots of different things. And so a customer would come in every once in a while and give them a, a USB stick, and then that person would go stick the stick into the mini lab, and it would develop the photos and print them, and the counter person would come back in a few minutes and um, or half an hour or whatever and pick up the photos and the USB drive and give it back to the customer or stick it on a shelf somewhere and wait for the customer to come back. So their whole usability was usability philosophy was people coming in infrequently to uh, operate the mini lab. But when they went out in the field and observed people using it, what they found was there was a person sitting on a stool just feeding one USB stick after another into the machine and the machines were in you know very highly utilized. And so certain aspects of the software they thought were highly usable actually were incredibly annoying to the person who had to go through like the same set of menu operations uh, repetitively for every single order when they were just sitting there in front of the machine pumping through uh, photo orders, order after order after order. Um, So, you know, and of course the technical staff came back as complete evangelists for the actual user experience and nobody had to convince them at that point that their user experience was messed up. They were the ones who wanted to fix it. Yeah, that's that's fantastic, and I loved reading that because you know one of the there's no silver bullets, right? Which is one of the deeper lessons of of software as well. Is there's no one button you can push to make all this magically work. It's it's actually quite complicated to get yes, any is. of this to work right. at all. It's incredibly complicated. Uh, right, you didn't run out of topics in your uh, in your blog after uh, three months. Uh, you've been going for a long time now, and I mean, that kind of says says it in itself. There's no shortage of topics that matter. Yeah, and in fact, a talk I gave recently, I um, talked about the show Chernobyl, the HBO show, which, which which is actually a brilliant engineering retrospective. It's basically the whole thing is a giant advertisement for what we call postmortems. When something goes wrong, in this case, horribly, horribly wrong, <laughs> in a way that the Earth has never seen before, um, the detective work and, and the value you get out of sort of doing a retrospective, which you also talk about in, in your book of, you know, something happened, in this case, something bad, but it as you also point out, you want to celebrate the good and the bad, like good things happen. Um, but just getting to the bottom of that and almost like just cataloging cataloging the ways you can fail, that's another topic you cover, uh, I definitely code complete, that really resonate with me. It's like, at least think about all the things you could do wrong and periodically mentally go, am I making this mistake? Am, are we making this mistake? Um, is really powerful. I mean, it seems like a negative way to look at the world, but it's easier to enumerate like, okay, and again, postmortems. If you look in the industry, like what are the common ways that software teams fail? You can at least think, well, if I'm avoiding the top five <laughs> ways that projects fail, and I'm actively thinking about them, I'm probably doing better than you know eighty, ninety percent of the teams out there, right? So, yeah, yeah another- and I think one of the interesting, you know, going back to the topic of what's improved over the years, is uh, when when we talk about risk management, we talk we differentiate between explicit risk management and and implicit risk management or extrinsic and intrinsic risk management. And explicit risk management is mostly what people think about. It's you're doing stuff where you explicitly identify risks and then take actions to reduce the risks 
on a risk by risk basis. But intrinsic risk management is essentially adopting development approaches that eliminate the possibility for the risk to exist in the first place. And I think one of the big ways that software development has advanced over the last, especially 20 years, has been the adoption of practices that simply eliminate the possibility of some of the big risks occurring. You know, we talked a little bit about the idea of big bang integration. Well, the idea of integration failure really doesn't exist anymore because the development uh, modes that people use make it essentially impossible for uh, software development to fail at integration time. Um, you know, likewise, the idea that if you go back and look at computing literature of the 1990s, including my book, Rapid Development, you know, one of the big problems at that time was the idea that people didn't know what the status of the project was. And that continued to be a big problem, I would say, at least into the mid-2000s, if not, you know, probably up to maybe 2010-ish. Um, but I think with uh, incremental approaches, especially Scrum and the use of uh, release burndown and so on, you know, we might still have only an approximate idea of what the status of the project is. But if we're if we're doing a meaningful job of release burndown, we're not going to have the case where we think that we've got three weeks left, but really we've got 18 months left. And that was just classic throughout the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, where your the error that you had in tracking the status of your project was, you, know, you would, I, again, I think somebody who had come out of school in the last five years could probably uh, question, how is it even possible for someone to think that they have three weeks left and still really have 18 months left? And it's a fair question, but, you know, that was pretty commonplace, uh, um, I would say, as recently as, you know, 15 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago. So, um, yeah, so I think that that's been a, a big improvement in the way software is developed is just, you know, knocking the knees out from under a lot of these bigger uh, risks. And, you know, we definitely still have the risk of misunderstood requirements, uh, not really understanding what the user wants. That's one reason I mentioned that. Uh, near silver bullet of putting developers in direct contact with customers is you know, we still see uh, you know teams that use you know pretty effective agile development practices but the part around requirements and really understanding user needs is not that effective so you know it's kind of the cliche of they're developing a solution to the wrong problem very quick quickly and efficiently and transparently but it's not the right solution so you know, in some sense, all that effort is wasted. And I also like, and again, this comes can come across as negative, but it's not meant to be, this attitude of, because you mentioned you, you're building the wrong thing. You should always have the mindset that I, I am probably building the wrong thing, um, but I, here are some hints that I might not be. You know, like actively always look for the path of proving that you're not literally building the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the, that's the, the norm. The, the norm is yeah. to build the wrong thing. Uh, and when you don't, it's like a happy accident. It's like, oh, we didn't build the wrong thing. We actually built something good that you know people wanted and people enjoy using is is more rare. It's something you have to treasure. It's something you have to like actively strive for. Uh, it's almost like failure is the default mode. Um, mostly because the domain is just really complicated. And by failure, I don't mean like complete failure, but just like, you know, meh, basically, like 50-50. Like it's half good, half bad. Um, it's debatable whether that's a failure, <laughs> uh, yeah. but the further you can push to the other side, it's like prove that you're actively, you know, getting great results. Um, I, th I think is important. Yeah, I think I don't talk about this in more effective agile, but there's an interesting book by Henry Petrosky, who's a civil engineering professor called uh, Design Paradigms. He goes through the uh, a number of famous bridge failures and tries to see what the common causes of the uh, failures are. And his dissection of it is basically that uh, most of the notable bridge failures occurred after a period of successful designs and occurred because the designers got into a mode of basically trying to copy the successful attributes of prior bridge designs instead of designing for all the failure modes of the new bridge. And his, his suggested remedy is essentially you need to consider the failure modes every time and really think through how are the very what, what are the unique aspects of this project and what are the unique ways that it could fail and then account for those in your design and and I think that applies to lots of aspects of software development like you said it applies to am I really building uh, so software that's going to delight the customer or is it uh, going to be met with complete uh, apathy 
Um, but likewise, is my design actually going to work or do I have flaws in my design? Uh, is my plan, does my plan make sense for the kind of software? Does it, you know, treat it as the, the right domain in the Kinevin model? Um, you know, have, is it appropriately staffed? Do I have the right people on the bus? All that kind of stuff. Yeah, there's like a million ways to fail and a precious few ways to succeed. So you got to kind of thread that needle. <laughs> yeah. And uh, if you do it right, it's actually just defensive engineering, it, it, as you mentioned with the bridges, right? You're just thinking, what are the basic physical properties we're always dealing with here? Like, what are the global constants? And how have we dealt with those? Like, always make sure in the back of your mind is, you know, we have to have fundamentally sound engineering, you know, right? Like, regardless of, you know, what it is we're actually building. Now, another sentence I really liked in your book, it says here, where sequential approaches fail in bureaucracy, agile approaches fail in anarchy. And that sentence also spoke to me because you're right, like there's not, there's no magic bullet here. You're just just balancing trade-offs, pros and cons, and trying to match your process to the, the, the thing that it's, it's marching alongside. In other words, the watery nature of software development requires a lighter, more delicate touch and like action at a distance, right, to really work. But the downside of Agile, and we definitely see this on open source projects, is anarchy, right? Like, it does feel an awful lot like anarchy at times, I must say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and the other thing that surprised me about open source is everything is always broken, right? Like, there's this sort of honesty about, look, you know, <laughs> we, we're doing what we can, but the and even with Discourse, like the the current version of Discourse is always the latest version that was checked in to GitHub, which sounds completely anarchic, right? Like, if if we're troubleshooting Discourse, one of the first things we'll tell people is like, well, install latest, install the, the very latest code in Discourse, so I can tell where you are, and I know you have all our old fixes, and you know whatever bugs you have are like bleeding edge, brand new bugs, which sounds totally anarchic, right? No software project would say, well, there's the stable version here, and then we have a beta version, and uh, it's just funny how far we got from that with discourse we're like nope just the current version is the best version we kind of have we we do have stable versions technically that we support and we'll back fix to because you know there's a certain amount of stability some people need but there's also like be honest and like look this is open source software it's going to be a little an anarchic like you're always going to want the latest version because that's the version i trust the most personally as a programmer and it's the version we essentially design for it's amazing like even on our hosting customers we really aggressively roll out latest versions to them hmm. um not not to the point that um for example meta discourse.org is actually live on github so you can go to github look up discourse project um every time someone checks something in that is built immediately and assuming it passes all our testing is deployed to meta.discourse.org like live with check-ins right mm -hmm. so it's a little more diverse than that for customers but this embracing of anarchy was was funny to me at first because you realize like oh my god everything is broken right like nothing is working exactly yeah. the way it's supposed to it's working for some definition of working and that's what you gotta like I believe you had another term in the book what was was the measurement of done right like how do we define yeah. done <laughs> you kind of change your definition of done for open source but then you're like I'm okay with this because it more correctly estimates like you know, software should be alive. It should be always growing. That's number one. You sort of alluded to that with the gardening metaphor, which is actually one of my favorites as well, because, you know, tilling the soil, appreciating the seasons, that's that's all very software-y stuff to me. Um, but th that's the acknowledgement you have to have, is, you know, this implicit anarchy is in the process, and and that's actually the correct model. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's you're, how you're so done. much deeper in open source than I am. Let me ask you a question or do a, do a check on one of my perceptions. Um, I, I tend to think of open source projects uh, in terms of, you know, in algorithm design, there's a notion of a heuristic algorithm that either converges or doesn't. And you know, one of the things you can have with a heuristic algorithm is that it can diverge. You just never get to a solution. And so with that kind of algorithm, you've got to have a seed that is a seed that leads to convergence. And it strikes me, at least in the early days of open source, one of the things that struck me was that it didn't seem like there were really examples of successful open source projects that started with nothing or an idea. It seemed like the successful open source examples started with some really significant chunk of design and code that somebody had already created that in a lot of cases was already pretty mature. Um, and then, And then if you had that as your seed, then you could have con a convergent open source project where people would contribute and it could expand and, and grow. 
Uh, but I'm curious what, because I think you're so much deeper in open source than I am. What's your What's your perspective on that? Do you think that how big a seed do you need, or do you think that analogy even makes sense? Um, I think there's plenty of like greenfield open source projects because a lot of things that come up are the classic programmer thing of I don't like your solution, it sucks, so I'm going to build you know this other solution that does essentially exactly the same thing, but in a way that I find more aesthetically appealing to me as a programmer. So does that start with like one really motivated person that's yes. not really in an open source mode? Uh, it can, yes. I mean, yeah. I think the the point you're getting to, and what I agree with, you have to get to a minimum viable kind of product somewhat quickly so that people can like see that you have something because there's another quote that I love it's like working code attracts coders and like design documents attacks attracts talkers <laughs> uh, so you see what I'm saying so you want to have like a functional thing that it starts attracting the right audience of like oh I see you've built x and it would be cool if this x did also did y you know, so I'm gonna pitch in, and and you know, so it's it's it's, it's at its core extremely iterative. I think the the ones that don't do that just fail. You know, they're just never yeah. gonna go anywhere. Nobody's gonna. Um, but you got to solve some interesting problem for some subset of people, and then they'll sort of um, travel alongside you um, on the path as because they're going the same direction you are, right? It seems like open source has the same issue that entrepreneurial startups have, which is huge amount of survivor bias. You know, you. You know about all the successful cases of the two guys in the garage that turned into Apple, but you don't know about the thousands of other cases of two guys in the garage that ended up just losing a year's worth of pay and then going back to work at whatever their local software company is. So, you know, failure is failure is a lot less visible in the startup world than success is. And then the other thing that's bleeding over, I think, a little bit is uh, really GitHub has become such a powerful influence on the really entire industry and mostly good because i think it normalizes open uh, not open source it normalizes a uh, source control you know uh in a sort of web friendly ui you know you're not actually working at the command line with git which is really nightmare mode right you're working with a web app where you can just click on stuff and stuff happens but i think that also bleeds over to to enterprise you know because microsoft famously bought uh github and then it's interesting, too, because Microsoft had a bunch of source control products, which I guess are in a weird place now because GitHub is such a, again, such a dominant uh, industry force. And, and GitHub <laughs> has an open source origins, both in, both in terms of the product. Git is open source itself, of course. And then the idea that, you know, if you're an open source project and you're not on GitHub, it's kind of hard for you to exist at this point. I mean, it's not like people are using SourceForge realistically anymore, are they? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so I have an interesting story yeah. if you want to hear some interesting history about it, Microsoft. All right, that's all the time we have. We'll continue with that story in the next episode in which Jeff and Steve continue their conversation about wise software development process today. Be sure to tune in again for another episode of Inspect and Adapt, the Constructs podcast. Until then, this has been Mark Griffin as your host. Jesse Bronson has been on the audio controls. And Devin Musgrave has been our producer. Have a great next sprint. If you enjoyed this episode of Inspect and Adapt, and you have comments or would like to talk to one of our practitioners, reach out via email using comments at constructs.com. Again, that's comments at constructs.com. And feel free to give us a positive rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you find us. We'd love to hear from you.